But we've got a really, really exciting um, session for you now, and I'm really thrilled to see some of the old faces who I used to work with when I first came into volunteering. Um, we're very, very lucky to have our speakers here today. My name is Mara Basanovic. I'm the CEO of Volunteering Queensland, so welcome. This is the final two of our sessions, and wasn't that a wonderful plenary, just this one previous? Um, David Crosby and Sue, uh, and indeed Mark, but they are just such leading figures in our in our area. And I always loved Andrew Lee, and I was so very sad that he's not aligned to a faction, and so therefore he lost his ministership. Um, and he has uh, become an assistant minister, but he keeps fighting for us. And I never understand why political parties would just put in somebody because they're in the same faction rather, somebody, rather than somebody who deserves to be there. But he's a big advocate for volunteering and we need to support him just as much as he supports us. And when we go, you know, when he talked about the, uh, David talked about the EP cubed, and it said media and public, you know, garnering public attention. Andrew Lee deserves all of our public support to get him out there um, as a minister again representing us. Um, so that's my bit of a political spiel. <laughs> Very personal view, but he is such a good fellow. And if you've not read his books, I can um, Please do so. He's a professor as well as a member of parliament, so he's very esteemed and very knowledgeable. So we have some very special guests today. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we're on Nullarbor lands and pay tribute to um, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, not just here on Nullarbor land, but all over Australia for those who are um, online today and pay really um, Deep, my deep respects to elders past and present and looking forward to us all working together in a really um, inclusive way going forward, particularly with the voice um, coming up as a referendum this, uh, this year. So without much ado, I would like to really introduce our speakers today. It's a very exciting um, topic and one that Volunteering Queensland is involved with in some research. And I know people, you know, groups like WA or Queensland, Northern Territory, South Australia, even Victoria, New South Wales have those hinterlands in regional and remote um, that, that uh, you know, it's very important that we support volunteering there. And that's where we are seeing fatigue. That's where we are seeing people still step up into two, three, four volunteering position. And they always tell us, if not me, who else? You know, and so um, the work we're going to hear about today is really inspiring. So our first speaker. Oh, right. All right. So Jack has just asked, and thank you, Jack. <laughs> Jack's been wonderful in these last two days. Um, so Jack asks if we can kind of squeeze in so that those people sitting on the steps, please take a seat. We need to keep that um, free as an emergency exit. So there's some room down here, guys, just kind of down here. So while that's happening, I'd like to just very quickly introduce our speakers. There are two sessions, each will be 20 minutes each. And following that, We'll have questions. So we'll we'll have questions at the end. If there's a really urgent question and you you know really really need to ask it between sessions, please just put your hand up and we'll try to um, answer that. But I think you'll really enjoy our speakers today. Our first speaker is Marjorie Pagini Pagani, and Marjorie is from Angel Flight Australia, and everybody will have heard of the extraordinary work. Angel Flight does right across our nation. Um, the, of course, the topic today is rural and remote volunteering. Following Marjorie, we will have a group of researchers who are, and, uh, and I say this with pride, leading global researchers in volunteering. So we're very, very lucky to have not only an innovative program like Angel Flights here, but also um, the most amazing researchers in volunteering who are uh, UNV users, IRV users have published many, many books between you all. And so they will be led by um, Professor Melanie Oppenheimer, 
from ANU. And then we'll have Professor Kirsten Holmes from Curtin University. We have Dr. Ann Annette Ma from ANU and uh, a re two researchers who weren't able to make it here, uh, Professor Annette Davies from the University of Western Australia and also Professor Leonie Loxton Binney, who unfortunately is unwell from Griffith University. And they're doing some work at the moment on rural remote volunteering. So I'd like to introduce Marjorie to come and give her presentation. And then following that, we'll introduce um, the others again. Thank you. Oh. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much. This is a, a really well subscribed uh, session. So everybody's obviously really keen about rural and remote, and I'm really keen that you're keen about rural and remote. I just very briefly, um, I started in one fashion with Angel Flight uh, 21 years ago uh, when it was being set up and I was then president of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and an aviation lawyer for my sins. And when it was being set up, I could see they really could have done with a lawyer. So uh, I jumped in and started pro bono then for well law work from then till now and uh, was one of their first volunteer pilots. Then in about 2014, our founder and general manager, Bill Bristow, who, who put in the seed capital and started the whole thing, he was diagnosed with terminal melanoma and he phoned me on a Friday and said, what am I going to do? And I was practicing barrister in Townsville at that stage and I said, oh, I'll come down. And I came down on the Monday, I said, look, I'll sort the place out, but I'll only stay for a year, Bill. So there we go. <laughs> that's that's how volunteering gets you and you all know that. I'm preaching to the converted. What I'm going to do is uh, firstly, just to play a little DVD. It's only a few minutes long, but it will tell the story of Angel Flight. And all of these are rural people. Remember, our remit is bring people in from the bush, non-emergency medical treatment, compassionate flights, COVID stuff, reuniting families, taking stuff out to floods, groceries, wherever rural people need help, that's what we do. So we're just rural. And this few minutes will really introduce you to this because these are the real volunteers and the real people that we help. And I want to follow that with capitalising on what I think is the focus for getting rural volunteers and keeping them engaged. So over to Jack to play this short video. Thank you. Whenever daunting distance keeps the sick from care, Angel Flight is there. With free flights to hospital and home again, Australia wide. I want to tell you a few very short, very human stories. There are many thousands of such stories in Angel Flight's history. These stories are not typical. Angel Flight has no typical stories. Every mission is unique and tailored to the needs of each passenger. We help rural Australians with health problems, with family struggles and serious financial worries. Australians with quite enough trouble without the daunting distances to travel for essential medical treatment. All Angel Flight services are free with volunteer pilots and volunteer drivers helping their passengers as if they were family. This is Poppy. She has a balance disorder that still has no specific diagnosis. She needs ongoing trips from her home in Coffs Harbour to Brisbane's Royal Children's Hospital. Leonie became profoundly deaf at age 47. In a pre-surgical check for a cochlear implant, a brain aneurysm was found. With a young family and living south of Sydney at Marimbula, Angel Flight has helped Leone nearly a hundred times. Kayla made nearly 400 flights with Angel Flight from her home in Chinchilla to Brisbane. Most of these flights were to receive hemolytic dialysis as early as sickness had left her with no kidneys. The Angel Flight team is dealing with up to 20 such missions every day of the week. If we have to drive this Sydney, it takes about five hours. Going on Angel Flight, it's an hour, a bit over an hour. Um, it's just absolutely wonderful. 
they're just fantastic. They're absolutely fantastic. Not enough people know about them. I tell everyone I know about them. Now, meet some of the real angel flight heroes, the pilots and drivers who volunteer so much to help those doing it so tough. We can see the need for people to get back into the seat of specialist care and we're more than willing to help. We wanted to put something back into the community and we saw a great connect between our know, joy of flying and the pleasure we've had out of it and uh, the opportunity to use that through the charity. Life's been pretty kind of me. I'm fortunate to be able to use an aircraft in my business and it's, it's one small thing I can do in return. Uh, they're just making donations to organisations. It's, it's, I find it's much better this way because so you get to meet the people that you're dealing with. And you can see the need there too. A full by road from Coffs Harbour to Brisbane made Poppy nauseous for days. With Angel Flight's help, she now avoids all travel side effects and is showing steady improvement. Leone continues flights for treatment in Canberra. She now has a second cochlear implant and with ongoing adjustment is hearing better and better. Ayla received a kidney transplant in 2008, which was functioning perfectly until 2011 when it sadly failed. Ayla passed away in 2013. So that's Angel Flight, providing free of charge, non-emergency medical transport for rural people of all ages needing to travel to and from treatment centres Australia-wide. Passengers are treated with sensitivity and respect, often beyond any they have ever experienced. Passengers are met on arrival in often strange and frightening cities by an equally caring volunteer driver who befriends them and takes them to hospital or accommodation. Angel Flight receives no government funding, relying solely on donations. We have no fundraising staff and spend no money on fundraising activity. Over 85 cents of every dollar donated is spent on aviation fuel and flight coordination. Angel Flight is nothing without the wonderful help of the many thousands of volunteer drivers and pilots who give selflessly of their time, their cars, their planes and their skill to help fellow Australians going through a very tough patch. Thank you very much. Now, I, I'm sure you will agree they tell the story better than I ever could. And to follow on from that, you see, we are purely focused on rural. That's not to say we don't have engagement with the cities. Obviously, that's where the big hospitals are. But a lot of what we do is really to capitalise on the passion, people's passions. And I suppose you hear it often enough about rural communities, small communities, they have community. Uh, the Cape communities, for example, everywhere we go, there is a sense of community in small places. So we have to do things a little bit differently from the way one would normally do it if you're focusing on big city. And that big city focus is often for donations. Uh, we don't actually ask anyone for money, but we've been able to, to work very successfully uh, for 20 years in April without doing that. We want to ramp up at the moment, so we are going to start heading up some of the Follies, uh, because what we're about to do is to launch a dedicated small jet service from every capital city, the core focus of which is to take doctors and allied health professionals and students for placements to remote areas, a dedicated service. That is a big expensive service, so we will need government funding to do it, but we can save uh, just in, in the New South Wales area, 100,000 doctor days a year by taking the doctors out instead of the people having to come in. We will still do this with our volunteer service. So I've been listening to some of the plenary sessions about, you know, how do you engage with politicians and so on, and it's very new for us because we haven't had to do it, but I'm a fast learner. Uh, whether I'm successful at it, I don't know. But we heard also that, and we know this, that the digital platforms are where it's at. You have to do that. And, and we uh, we don't send out asking for, for money, but we certainly send out uh, information and awareness and we make our website very user-friendly. Do you want to be a pilot? Do you want to be a driver? <laughs> do you want to volunteer? Uh, 
But one way we are really successful, and it's really a testament to community in Australia, that personal engagement and word of mouth still works. Now, we're not a huge um, uh, charity, and, and of course some are for-profit as well as not-for-profit and run businesses. So, so we're not in that category. But what we do is not only do we unashamedly capitalise here on pilots' love of flying, um, that's what we do. They buy the aeroplanes, we fly our aeroplanes. Um, we, we get a fuel reimbursement. I don't take it, but um, they, they, they can ask for a fuel reimbursement. That's one third of the cost of operating an aircraft. And that doesn't include buying the thing. Um, and likewise with the drivers, the drivers are there obviously just to help. I mean, I don't think they really love traveling from Bankstown Airport across the M1 in peak hour to Manly Children's Hospital for two and a half hours in peak hour and back, but they do it. And you see it here because it's a personal engagement. They get to meet the people. Those drivers actually quite become family. Not so much with us pilots because we're quite busy. And uh, of course you have a bit of a yarn and so on, but you're not engaged the same way the drivers are. So the pilots are easy. They're really easy meet. Um, and and once, you, once you've done a certain amount of flying, uh, you kind of get over sort of wanting to punch holes in the sky on a Sunday just because you can. And as you heard from some of these volunteers, they prefer to do this rather than just make donations. Not that donations aren't welcome, we all know that. Uh, but that is an amazing way they can help. Uh, we started, we kicked off in an old air ambulance hangar um, in uh, April 22 in April 2002, um, with uh, 80 volunteer pilots, no drivers and no passengers. And now I have 8,000 uh, pilots and drivers, about yeah. half each. Uh, we've carried over 100,000 families, um, over 60,000 flights. And the saving too, I heard somebody say earlier, people think that it's a good thing to save government money. That's not how I think, but um, we have certainly contributed to our communities more than $130 million worth of travel. So how do we engage in the rural communities? Well, we, again, we engage with other charities. So what we do, it's, it's people like me, um, we run this entire operation up to 120 flights a week with five staff. Uh, or a group of young ladies who are flight coordinators and me, who jack of all trades. And I won't say the master of none because I haven't kind of admitted that yet, still getting to that. But it's a very small operation. It's very tight. We don't waste money. But of course, the major contributions come from our volunteers. We couldn't do it without them. What we do in the communities, we go either people like me or our volunteers, our drivers and pilots who've actually done the thing. People love hearing from these people, these volunteers. This, and we talk about Kayla. Kayla was part of our family and it was very sad when we lost her, but she was our family for 14 years. And that 14 years was so much better for her than it would have been otherwise. So we, we take some solace in that. People love to hear these stories. We go out into these communities and I mean everywhere across Australia and we'll land in paddocks and we'll land on Roads, don't tell Casa. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to these communities. And what we do is we just talk to groups. It'll be CWA or Lions or Rotary. Now, how, how does that help across Australia? Well, if you talk to a Rotary group and they like what you're saying, they will put it on Rotary International. They'll put it on their podcasts. We cover the entire nation by going to... Hay in New South Wales, for example. And then what happens after that? The communities help us back because they're invested in us. And because we make it personal and sharing of information, CWA, you share it there, they share it. Wonderful group. Little town, I'll mention Hay because it's not far from where we are, uh, and Malakuta down on the coast, places like that. Hay runs a, a 
a dirt and dust festival for us every year. Tiny little town, if any of you know, hey. And they raise about $36,000 for us every year. And we have in the bush music festivals and horse trail rides. We don't we don't organise those things. Our only stipulation is that they are run by volunteers. So there isn't any money going to somewhere else when people think they're volunteering for us. We don't want the money going else. We don't pay any commissions or marketing fees, none of that stuff. But what we do out in those communities is engage personally. Now, you might think that's pretty hard. Some of you, you know, have big city bases. Um, but you can do it. We just send our volunteers out and they'll drive. So we pick, you know, if you're living there, you can go there. And so we have a big database and say, look, you know, CWA in, in um, Colorado would like somebody to talk to them. So we put it on our bulletin board and one of the pilots, because it's too far to drive, but one of the pilots will say, yeah, I'll go out to Collie for the weekend and talk. Then the community gets behind us. Then they fundraise for us. Then they tell through their other social awareness organisations, they tell everybody. And one of the reasons we have we do that is we truly do want to engage with them because we don't pay for advertising. That first 60 seconds was actually an ad that's run free for us uh, across Australia, but we don't pay for any advertising. So we can't tell everybody about us. We can't tell the revolving door of rural doctors uh, about us and there's no handover. But through the communities, we keep this alive. So you can send people out, they talk to them, they become engaged, we become part of their family, uh, they fundraise, they tell other people, and that is how we work. Uh, we certainly do use the digital platforms, but again, if you're talking very rural, a lot of the time, uh, the demographic is quite older people. Um, and yes, some of them will use emails, but they're not all sort of sitting there on Facebook, sort of um, they like to get a letter. Uh, that's a difficulty because postage is so expensive and we don't spend the money doing that. So we will use the digital platforms. But quite honestly, it's the personal engagement and you talk, you send one pilot or one driver or in the case of, you know, one volunteer with a passion about what they do. And of course, they all are passionate or they wouldn't wouldn't be doing it. It's a big ask what we ask of them. I have one pilot in um, Malacuta, comes out of Malik, not Malacuta, he comes out of Moorabbin and he doesn't own an aeroplane, but he's a very experienced pilot and he hires uh, an aeroplane and he's done 1,600 flights for us at a cost to him of $1.5 million. Uh, he loves to fly <laughs> and and fortunately he can afford to fly and of course a lot of our, our, not the drivers so much, but the pilot volunteers, they are reasonably well off, a lot of them and have, as you say, businesses so they can use the aeroplanes in there. So that, that's not for everybody, but what can be for everybody in this rural environment is personal engagement. And it's only because we've done what we've done for so long and we can see the success of it uh, and how much more we can now help than we used to be able to do that we see the value, the real value of word of mouth. Uh, and, and honestly, what we what we now do, if for example, if we're going out to uh, to Burke, Western New South Wales, we'll say, all right, we're going out to talk to a, a Rotary Club, say, but we then ask them to help us to get the community involved. So we invite the mayor and the councillors, and we invite all the other charity or non -profit, not for profit groups. So now, when we go a long way like that. We ask everybody to get involved. And that's not to say the other charities can't have their two bobs worth. Showing my age now, I know, that's all right. Um, uh, because they can come and say, look, this is how we can help. And we we drive people locally to hospitals. Good, let's, let's work with you because most of our drivers are in the cities because that's where you land to go into the hospitals and so on. But without the support on the ground in the rural communities, people would simply not know about us. And it's 
the digital media platform, of course, you all know is wonderful and uh, it, it's very helpful. You, you will all be aware of the, the Lismore floods and, and the first lot of floods we had last year. Um, I just saw it on television. And so I thought, crikey, they've got no food. They've got nothing out there. So I picked up the phone, talked to a couple of girls. They jumped on our Facebook page. Well, that was a Friday night. By Monday morning, we had 12 aircraft out of Sydney and Brisbane, 10 tonne of donated groceries. And we flew out in a big convoy too. We, we actually landed at Ballina because we couldn't get into Lismore. And I had a pilot on the ground arrange a convoy of trucks, or utes, in fact, with trailers. <laughs> and uh, truck sounds better, but it's utes and trailers. And uh, within 30 minutes of landing, they were all this stuff was at a distribution point in Ballina. And including the uh, Kempsey uh, RSL Club in Sydney uh, donated a beautiful new caravan and paid for it shipping. So we were able to give a family uh, a caravan to live in. Now that happened over the weekend. One phone call. It, it's really quite amazing. So yes, certainly the digital platform is what got us everything in, but it was really, let's contact a few people and we'll get this rolling. COVID was another example. And we were chatting about this earlier. We, we got kids home to their parents. Our first one, some of you might have seen on Channel 7, little chap called Memphis, uh, gorgeous little fellow. And uh, he'd been down to Griffith to see his grandma on a holiday and from Queensland. And then he got stuck in COVID and they wouldn't let him home. And he hadn't seen his mum for three months. So we started lobbying the governments of New South Wales and Queensland and later every other government. And we sort of got the thumbs down. But some of us are very persistent. And uh, we finally managed to, to allow us to go in. We had all sorts of protocols sterilising the aircraft. I remember one lady said to me, I've been telling everyone you ster sterilise the pilots. So, <laughs> but we didn't. So, we, we and if, if you had to be there, it shows how all this is worth it. Well, Memphis landed, we had several aircraft. He landed in... Uh, in uh, Archerfield Airport in Brisbane and mum came down from Queensland, another airport and the airplanes here and here. Two big policemen next to little Memphis, who's three, and uh, you, you just wait with us, son. And uh, he saw mum and I thought, well, you ever see, you know, Rocky Balboa? And you got this little type with his little fat legs and he's stumbling across there because his mum and we did a lot of that stuff so again it comes to if you if you allow people to get involved in the passion of what you're doing look those pilots i can tell you some of what they had to do they weren't allowed to get out of their air aircraft to pee after three or four hours of flight so that we could not have memphis contaminate the world but that's <laughs> but that that's my message to you is the passion, personally reach out. It's old fashioned, but it works. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Marjorie. Angel of Lights is indeed inspirationally, uh, inspirational, great work and wonderful presentation. Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, word of mouth and personal connection is still one of the most, if not the most, powerful and popular way that people get into volunteering. So, you know, what you say rings true. It's not old fashioned at all. And if I could just one, say one little thing, one of our previous staff members whose grandparents live in Ballina, they have a farm, they had the highest points. So it was the only place that helicopters and planes could go and land. So your planes probably landed near or on um, their property. And we had these amazing photos of this elderly lady and uh, gentleman looking at these helicopters and you know and airplanes landing on their property and then distributing help so um really powerful stories um it now gives me pleasure to invite um professor kirsten holmes professor melanie oppenheimer and dr annette ma between them to present on rural it's the modern history of rural vol volunteering interventions thank you and welcome kirsten Yeah.
Thank you. And um, Marjorie, that was such an amazing presentation. It's going to be quite hard to follow. Um, you know, get the passion that you felt and all the work that your organisation is doing is just amazing um, and really highlights just how important um, volunteering is in regional and rural communities and also um, some very specific challenges that um, volunteers and volunteer involving organisations in those locations face, which aren't necessarily mirrored by um, metropolitan or um, other areas. So we're going to sort of take you back um, through some historical analysis of how the rural and regional volunteering situation today is the result of a number of indicators and factors and, and points that have happened over the past um, Oh, 50 years or so, really. Um, so I'm I'm the only person not on this screen here. So um, I'm a member of the project team. Uh, so we have uh, th this is the first stage of a project that um, this. Oh, it's going to go back to the previous slide. Um, and, and yeah, so um, yeah, so my colleagues, um, Leonie is the project leader and then oh, 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 that way. Uh, so this is a project which is funded by the Australian Research Council, but it's in partnership with Volunteering Australia, uh, Volunteering Queensland, Volunteering Victoria, Volunteering South Australia and Northern Territory and Volunteering Western Australia. So although we, we're a group of academics, we are working very, very closely with the peak bodies nationally to um, develop a rural roadmap for volunteering in Australia. So this will kind of come under the national strategy, looking at um, what are the specific needs, challenges that rural and regional volunteering and volunteer involving organisations need to have addressed to create a vibrant sector going forward for the next 10 years. So that's my little introduction. I'm now going to pass over to Professor Melanie Oppenheimer, who led this part of the project. Thanks, Kirsten. OK, so. Um, all right, thank you. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, an overview. We're going to just look at these three points, changes over time, issues and concerns within volunteering initiatives in volunteering infrastructure. Now, some of these points are actually relevant to urban Australia as much as they are to rural Australia. There's a lot of in interconnections, but there are some specifics as well. Now, I'd just like to start off with a kind of little personal sort of reflection as well. I mean, I'm a, I'm a girl from the bush. I grew up in rural New South Wales. Um, I've now gone home, home to live. Um, you know, you've got to stop somewhere and I couldn't think of a better place than Walker in northern New South Wales. Um, and I come from a family of volunteers um, and I just, uh, much of our iconography of volunteering over time, much of our, you know, sort of quintessential organisations actually come out of the bush. Rural Fire Service, CWA, um, Royal Flying Doctors. I mean, they're kind of all rurally based um, initially. Um, but when you look at our history, volunteers just do not appear. They are completely invisible. So back in 2008, I published this book and I volunteering why we can't survive without it. And what I was trying to do in that book was to try and look at the history of Australia um, but through the lens of volunteers. So put volunteers at the front and, and central category of analysis um, because it just simply isn't there. And I think particularly when we're looking at rural and regional Australia, it is so important. Um, now, I, I begin this book with a short account of my maternal um, volunteer forebears. My great-grandmother, Grace Monroe, was the foundation president of CWA um, back in 1922, and CWA has just celebrated its 100th anniversary last year. You know, talk about reinvigoration and regeneration. That is a kind of case study of an organisation that everyone in the 70s thought was, you know, long gone and didn't want to have anything to do with, and now is really back and and front and centre of revitalising local communities in many places in Australia. Um, and she she was, you know, the CWA was important to her because as a rural woman, she had lost a child 
um, due to the lack of medical services for women and children back in um, in the early um, 1920s. Um, my grandmother, um, Nancy Niverson, she was a World War, uh, volunteer during World War II. She was really involved in the Red Cross. She later became involved in um, setting up the Horticultural Society in Walker. She helped establish the swimming pool, all these sorts of things. When I go back in my past, I just see my, my, my maternal, particularly um, forebears are there. And then my mother spent years devoting unpaid labour to the National Trust and to environmental groups. Um, in, in the area. But these rural women, these Nancys, these Graces, these Gillians, they're not unusual. Our history and our rural communities are just peppered with these types of individuals. And we need to know more about them and we really need to um, just remind ourselves of their importance. Um, so I hope you can sort of read these, but basically the changes over time in rural Australia, and we did our analysis from the 1970s onwards when there was a really significant shift, um, much of it to do with um, the Whitlam government, actually from 1972 to 75, there was a lot of changes happening in the rural and regional space. But here, and, and these are things that not only pertain to rural, but they're general to Australia. So changes in the international economy, leading to free trade agreements, um, removal of tariffs, they had a huge impact on rural Australia. And of course, things that happen on farming communities then impact on, on rural communities. Government policies changed, the rise of neoliberalism, services centralised to larger centres, lead, leading to closures in smaller communities, this centralisation. Um, that has an impact on, on um, the areas in between. Um, people moving away. Now, this has been a long narrative with a, it, it is, it has happened, you know, generational over time, children not returning, FIFO, fly in, fly out has had a huge, and I would say detrimental impact really on, on rural communities, um, has led to changes in community engagement. Of course, with COVID, with many people moving to the regions, suddenly, as long as the NBN and the internet can hold up, um, you know, maybe we might see that that shift will, will be maintained, still the jury's out. And then of course, climate change, floods, fire, disaster, drought, cyclone. These have always been part of our past, but they are coming with increasing um, rapidity and, and um, you know, there, there are more of them. But there are some positives as well, okay? So rural revitalization in small and mid-sized towns in particular, um, the arrival of new migrants, okay? Some of these programs, they're, they're made to go there, you know, they don't necessarily want to go and live in Armidale, you know, where is it? But, you know, there, there are these programs to, to move out new migrants and um, into rural communities. We are beginning um, to, to value and, and, and to see Indigenous understandings of volunteering. They don't call it volunteering, but the sort the, it's ingrained in, in the culture of our First Nations people. We're beginning to understand that and come and, 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 and celebrate that and how our First Nations people care for country, the way that they engage. These are things that are beginning to have a positive impact in communities. Emphasis on tourism, rural arts and festivals. This is you know, really beginning to, to happen. And then emphasis on communities creating local solutions, looking and returning to each other and saying, OK, how can we actually, um, how, what can we do um, looking, looking locally? Um, so issues and concerns within volunteering. Again, I apologise for the small font, um, but these headlines are from volunteer centre newsletters from the ninth, early 1990s. You can see a lot of these issues are just the same. So there is this sense of Groundhog Day often in our, in our history and particularly with volunteering, honestly, it really is. So this is, you know, from the early 1990s, um, uh, you know, unemployed volunteers, the new image, um, Volunteers and policing, a new option. These are things that have come and gone or, you know, still here. Is volunteering exclusive? Um, should volunteers replace retention employees? That used to be a really big thing. We kind of not sort of looked at that. And we've been hedging around the edges at this conference, actually. 
um, with that. Um, who needs employee volunteer? Interesting. So these issues that have been going around for the last sort of 20, 30 years, definitions of volunteering, it's come and gone, it's changing, it continues to evolve, it's not static. Formal versus informal volunteering used to be a big thing, you know, bit of tension, not anymore, it's much more inclusive. Types of volunteering, corporate volunteering, who is the volunteer, the business or the employee? Um, pathways to employment, are people on benefits coerced to volunteer? That's the mutual obligation. Again, haven't had a lot of that at this conference, but these are issues that were very, very important, you know, um, and are still there bubbling away. And of course, important in rural areas as well. Motivation, altruism versus self-benefit. Who works for no pay? There are people that just think, you know, well, you must be crazy to actually do something for no financial remuneration. They don't get it. There is a significant number of people in our community who think like that. So, um, you know, Kirsten and I were involved with Leone on a project about, about not looking at why people volunteer. Why do people not volunteer? That is really the big $64,000 question. And um, of course, that's a project for another day to discuss. But you know, if you want to ask us in question time, you can. Volunteering as a service delivery or advocacy or mentoring, um, again, with, with um, you know, government policies, changing mutual benefit, all this sort of thing, there's been a change to that. And where should volunteers work? That used to be a thing. You know, should they only work in not-for-profit organisations? What are the volunteers doing working in for-profit or for governments? You know, maybe those people should be paid. These used to be quite live, active um, discussion points in volunteering in the past. Not so much now. I can't, I mean, I'd like to just say, you know, why? That's kind of interesting, really. Um, OK, so. Annette, I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Annette Ma, who's been helping us as a research assistant and who also has done a lot of work on um, volunteering infrastructure to take us through this slide. Uh, just one of the things we wanted to talk about today was the development of the volunteering infrastructure, particularly the volunteer resource centres that operate in urban and regional um, areas around Australia and in times past in smaller towns uh, when there was lots of funding and opportunities. The history of the volunteer infrastructure really begins once they're established in the 80s, but there's germs of uh, yeah, linkages that go back into the 70s, starting with the Whitlam government, for instance, in Albury Wodonga, that even though they actually set up in, I think it was about 1982, early 80s, the the germ, the germs, uh, the germ, with the termination, what was it? Origins it can be traced back to the policies of the government, regionalisation and uh, con uh, emphasis on community and social uh, uh, things like that. So the volunteer centres around Australia, they were differentiated in name to volunteer resource centre as opposed to volunteer centre. The volunteer centres were situated in every state and territory um, by the 2000s and they have Darwin since amalgamated with um, Adelaide, before that, it had been amalgamated with Volunteering Australia. So they looked after, uh, for a short period of time, Darwin and Alice Springs. Um, and But for the rest, they started, they first starting in New South Wales with Sydney down and Melbourne about the same time, and all around Australia. They set up, had one way of moving, and then there were the volunteer resource centres, which are extremely difficult to actually say, this is what a volunteer resource centre looks like, because no two are the same. You can have in um, a small town, regional Western Australia or rural Western Australia, you can have a person who comes in to a library for a day or two to help people find volunteering, organise uh, placements, work with organisations. And you can have on the other side of the country, there are volunteer resource centres that actually via in in funding and the amount of work they can do, just in sheer volume, some of the work that is similar to the volunteer centres themselves. At least that was in the past. 
um, funding unfortunately has been decreased and uh, a lot of the volunteer resource centres unfortunately no longer resist, exist. But originally they were set up to identify and respond and initiate services to actually provide a focal point for volunteering that may not have existed in smaller areas. Now that's not to say that it, volunteering in the smaller areas didn't exist, it did, but it, it was often a way of, okay, how do we talk together? Instead of me going out networking with you, I'll go to the volunteer centre and they can set up, you know, they'll network. And so we've got a, a place to go, a place to talk to uh, and get something happening. They um, led to enormous um, work and they actually brought an attention to volunteering in rural and remote areas that was non-existent in, in some areas. They did fantastic work. And uh, just uh, finally, one of the things they did do Oh, just before I tell you what they do, one of the things that I that's really interesting in the volunteering um, infrastructure is looking at how they the centres all originated. And Tasmania is a state where the volunteer resource centre in or the centre in Hobart now um, actually originated from a network of volunteers, and there were uh, a volunteer of volunteers and volunteer managers social workers and they were situated up the north of the co of the state northwest and they were called the northwest volunteer association and they lobbied everybody they got task involved who was instrumental in helping them set up they got the governments involved they lobbied the federal government there was nothing these people thought they couldn't do they just thought they wanted a center and unfortunately when they did get it the federal government just had to be in Hobart. But that didn't stop them because they then rallied to support the development of the state centre in in the uh, in Hobart. And they did that. So they got their funding in 93. They held their first volunteer conference in 95, a state conference. And then they had the national in 96. And when I was interviewing people was doing my study, they said we had no money. We half the time we didn't know what we were doing, but we were sure we were doing the right thing. So they for accommodation, everybody they just put who's got a bed. And so all the delegates were stayed in people's other delegates' houses. So it was a real community led um, initiatives, both of them, considering that was so new and they were just so, there's their determination and their passion is something that's been talked about the last two t days over and over again to see that they could do something and they did it. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say that the volunteer resource centres, while a lot of them are very small, they have also been instrumental in actually developing resources that have been used across the country, um, taken up by state um, uh, organisations and uh, other regional resource centres. And I've just got a couple of um, examples. For instance, WA, the Esperance VRC, Develop Bridging the Gap to Volunteering, New South Wales, um, Volunteer Resource Centre developed the VC Handbook on planning and implementing and managing volunteers. Um, that was in 98. They did the uh, book of stories of great stories of the volunteer existence. Albury and Wodonga did the two-way uh, go volunteering tool kit post. Um, so they actually, so you can see that they had um, the volunteer centres and actually the resource centres actually had a big impact on the way volunteers are managed today. And that influence has gone all over Australia. It hasn't been just, didn't stay in one place or in one state. Um, thank you. Thanks, Annette. And as you can see from the slide, 1999-2010, this, this is a growth period. It's been referred to a couple of times about the Sydney Olympics, United Nations um, Year of the Volunteer 2001. We're getting government ministers for volunteers for the first time. South Australia, the Premier is the Minister for Volunteers. We had champions in the, in the room. Um, the result is increased funding, increased interest, increasing in volunteers, and then loss of funding, um, withdrawal of programs, Lot, lot, if we think that volunteering has gone down, it's got a lot to do with the lack of, of interest at the highest levels, particularly after 2010 
in, and I think the evidence is fairly strong for that. Okay, so rural volunteering, just a, cu a couple of key points. The creation of necessary services for the whole community. I mean, any of us who live in rural Australia know that most of the things that are accepted in the cities, they don't happen in the bush unless people do it themselves. We might get a little bit of funding for a community bus or something like that, but basically we have to do it ourselves and we don't have access to things that are accepted in the cities. Transport costs, increase in petrol, um, incredible um, uh, pressures on volunteers at every level, at everything that you do. Um, smaller populations, um, which leads to less diversity of skills often, or the same people doing everything, or the village Napoleons they're sometimes called. Uh, I guess we all know a few of those. Fewer people to call on, and then you get too busy with other commitments. And then limited access to training and management support, particularly when the, the volunteer resource centres get defunded and then, the, you know, like there's nowhere to go and what do you do? So these are the sorts of um, pressures that, that everyone is under um, at the bush in, at the moment. However, there are some positives. Okay, so the Grey Nomad Scheme, um, uh, over 50 year olds, we heard, heard that wonderful example, Perinka, we heard yesterday morning, that wonderful example of um, the, the visiting volunteers, um, you know, setting up a whole, you know, fixing up a, a gold mine, old gold mine town. So the benefits of these um, visiting volunteers, there's economic benefits, you get people coming in, staying in the caravan park, you know, sort of spending money. Um, human resources with skills and experience, promoting of the town or community to a wider audience. I mean, you know, if you get someone coming to Walker and they have a great experience and the weather's okay and it's not too cold or something like that, you know, they go away and they spread that word. It's that word of mouth thing again often that that is, is key. And also then the benefit for the individual volunteers, you know, building social networks, using the school, feeling useful um, and an opportunity to be part of a community to actually help out and feel as if you're you're making a contribution. Blaze Aid is another one that is being is is you know in rural Australia and really um, doing a great job. Um, volunteers have to be over the age of twelve, but otherwise there's no sort of age um, thing with Blaze Aid. So the idea is is that there are these programs that are working, and of course I'm sure there are others as well. So just some preliminary reflections on findings, um, and I'll just say this is a photograph from the 1970s um, with flooding, the Red Cross, you know, these things, they just, you know, it, it's in our history. These things happen a lot. Um, and that's what happens when you build on floodplains, I guess. Um, OK, so the lessons from history, there's continuity and change. OK, things happen, things change, but things, some things stay the same. Um, rural communities also have never been static. Although there are those people that are there forever, all those families that, you know, it is actually, it, it does move and it does change shape and it does change character. Well, to point, say when I think of my own community, <laughs> population has been like 1500 for, I don't know, 100 years. It just doesn't seem to, it doesn't go down, but it doesn't go up. Um, social, economic, cultural drivers, these are the things that, that impact Australia right a global. You know, we, we, we suffer the same sorts of things as others, as other Australians. Climate change is, is real, it is happening, and it is so um, important for rural Australians. But the urban straw, sprawl as well. So what areas that used to be rural are now urban? So that is a shift. That is one of the changes that has occurred. Um, and has changed how, how you know the organisations, communities, volunteers, emergencies, of course, and then um, government policies. I'm pretty big on this one because I actually think these they. It's all very well for communities to say, for people to say, go out and just do it because we do that anyway, right? But we do need help, and we do need support, and we never ask for very much. But just a little bit more than pin money would be would be great. So really, we just want to um, um, open it up for questions now, um, which of course Mara will do. But I just want to ask, how many people here are from rural communities? Yeah, yeah. So um, we're interested in your feedback. This is the early stage of the of the project. What's that? Oh yeah. We actually, if any of you are interested in doing a PhD,
See, you can do it just once. Just once in your life. It's not something that you do more than once, but if anyone, we actually have a PhD attached to this project, as I said, as Kirsten's, yeah, we have a scholarship. Oh yeah, PhD, you have to earn it. Yeah, yeah. We've got the scholarship attached um, to working with um, based up in the Gold Coast, which is kind of nice, with Griffith University. But um, if you are interested at all, please get in touch with Kirsten or myself or Leonie Loxton Binney, in fact, who's the lead CI. Um, as I say, this is the beginnings of this project. Um, and we're very interested to hear back from you about things that maybe particularly resonate with you, things that we've missed, things you think that are important, um, that we should consider, and we're really um, open to uh, hearing back from you. Thank you. Um, thank you to Melanie, to Kirsten and to Annette. And if you are interested in a PhD, you couldn't ask for any better supervisors. And also you'd be staying in the volunteering family, which is kind of gorgeous. Um, Thank you for a very insightful uh, uh, presentation. We're really thrilled to be in, involved with it. And Melanie, um, you know, we, we can't underestimate the power of research to give us the evidence that we need and to promote good practice. And Melanie said something very um, interesting to me yesterday, and it was that every single page of our new strategy is underpinned by solid research that's been provided by the research subcommittee. And that's a very, you know, very, very true um, observation that you made. And it really shows the importance of investing in good research as well. Melanie loved a story about your great grandma, your grandma and your um, mum and volunteering certainly is in your DNA, but it really shows the power of both learning and leading by example. Um, so thank you for that. I'd like to say first, just thank you very much to Marjorie and to Annette. And it's We also will make sure that um, Kirsten and Melanie are acknowledged the same way later. I now open the floor to questions and Annette's kind enough to be the, the person with the mic. So it looks like we've got a lot, Annette. So the first one here. No, no, thank you. Um, so my question is the lessons that we've learned from the volunteer resource um, centres is that they were established and structure was about funding. So as soon as that dissolved, that meant that dissolved that whole structure and that work that would have got momentum died with that. So had we been able to think about that business structure or the way that that could have been more sustainable, could have kept those resource centres there? Because I think from a rural area myself, a regional area, it's we're back, we're doing it again, but in a different way this time. So I think there's those lessons that you're really clearly putting up here is about those structures and how do we develop those models, that structure that builds that sustainability. Um, I have no easy answer to that because um, because the, the, the structures are very different and they're fluid and organisations don't uh, last forever. But from, from my take on your question is how do we not lose what is learned there? Uh, how the experiences that people have gone through, the, the ways that they've used that could be used by others, the next generation to do the same thing going over and over again. And I'd put a plug in to all of you to look at your records and your documentation and actually consider where it would go if your organisation no longer existed. Um, that uh, th th this is a problem for all organisations that you think, oh, well, I'm only a small organisation. I don't have a lot to offer. Uh, people will know or, you know, we did this back then. It doesn't matter anymore. It does matter because uh, people are, um, they're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I've been in the volunteer infrastructure for a very long, long time, being a bit old. 
And the what struck me as listening to some of the things is I'd hear something say, oh, I did that. And I, I did that, but nobody nobody knows. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to know what I did, but the, if that had been documented, someone in another organisation or the next iteration of that organisation or, you know, across the road down the street, someone might have, that would have taken five minutes that they didn't have to think about that. They didn't have to try and work out that, little strategy of the little of that little thing so yes i think it's a real it's a real crime that organizations like the vrcs um, that have existed in small areas and they've gone and i bet a lot of their um so and it's not as easy as saying i oh, will take it to the state library because i know uh northern volunteering in south australia they tried and the state library turned them back so whether they're you know I'm not saying they had more funding, but whether there is, you know, like um, at some stage people would actually just put up or be aware in your in the different states if you can't do it nationally um, of who did what and and it's kept a record of it. Um, yeah, the so communities are doing it for themselves. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. doing it. They're not waiting for national or state. No, we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The other way it. Sorry, that's the mic here. If that's all right. Um, fantastic presentations. I just really um want to to thank the researchers, particularly for shining the light on the work of um VRCs um nationally and especially um with what um Marjorie was saying about the importance of that personal connection and that VRCs in localities actually trade on that personal connection and that there is a move, um, I guess, towards everything being available online and, and that's how volunteer management and support happens and, and we just know it doesn't. Um, so it's kind of not a question, but it's a bit of a plea to get behind the volunteer resource centres that are still in existence. We've got a stand in the exhibitors hall. Um, please come and have a chat to us and thank you again for for really shining a spotlight on the work that we we know all our members do it's, it just, it's their their demise, it's part and parcel of the demise of all the other suits, the banks, the postals, etc. But who would have thought that voluntary infrastructure was actually developed enough to actually disappear? These are all of these. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, guys. I can't repeat that, but um, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, my question's for Marjorie. Um, so one thing that has changed in recent years is the rise of the ESG strategy um, within corporates, banks and, and the like. Now, you mentioned that you were going to go to government for support, but there's obviously some organisations out there. And I think instantly to Uber's impact strategy, to Qantas, that could align in a partnership sense very much to what you're trying to achieve. What, what do you think about that? that I'm going to try and find out how this works. Yes, it's it's working. And yes, we do have corporate sponsors, uh, people, for example, IHG Case, which are agricultural, industrial, Rothschilds Bank, uh, and, and quite a lot of others. But we, at this point, have never gone out seeking their help, but they get to know about us. So yes, we have some generous corporate sponsors. And certainly, if we... Uh, proceed in every state as we hoped with our small jet service, you know, dedicated to medical transfer for professionals and students, then we will be actively looking for more corporate support. I understand uh, Gina Reinhardt might have a $15 million pocket book. <laughs> oh, she might have given it to someone else. I was too late. But yes, you, you're quite right. We have to look now. If we're going to get bigger, we do have to look. We can't rely on government, uh, but we do have to look more at the corporates, um, big corporate sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question here. 
Oh, mine was just, um, I spent many years coordinating volunteer drivers in a regional area for a local hospital. And the stories that you've shared are the benefits of the patients. And I could tell endless stories about the benefits and the health benefits that the volunteer drivers themselves shared with me over and over again. Is that something that they also share with you and beyond in your promoting as well, I'm wondering. They do, and we get uh, emails constantly after drives to talk about uh, what they've talked about with the passenger in terms of how they could help more and how it's been good for them and how it's lifted their spirits and how they realise that their problems in life are really not that great and, of course, are made even less by their ability to help others. We get it all the time from particularly the drivers because they get to know the people and one of the plenary group speakers earlier was talking just about you know well what what does it do for the volunteers uh but certainly the pilots uh, as well but to a far greater extent the drivers uh many many of whom are retired and perhaps don't want to just stay at home and trim the roses uh and uh they, they are very, very active and we have four and a half thousand drivers and we can just call on them at any time. I'll put their hand up because they do tell us exactly that. It's such a meaningful thing for them to do, particularly into advancing age. And they, they benefit, I'm sure they live longer, healthier and mentally healthier lives for the volunteering and we do with their consent of course we put out on our volunteers pages uh facebook pages these stories to share with other volunteers the other thing we do is every single year in every capital city we draw together the uh, volunteers uh, mostly drivers in the big cities and everybody gets to meet everybody else in that region we also go out and have our board meetings in small uh, communities. Uh, last week we went to Port Lincoln. I was just talking to a young lady here from Aldinga, where I flew into to uh, firstly before going over to Port Lincoln. So, and when we go to those places, we invite all the volunteers in that region and the local government people and community service people every time we go out there. And, and it's mostly to say, hey, thanks. Yeah, it's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have time for one more question here. I think my question is too big for 30 <laughs> seconds, but I'll give it a go. Um, I'm very proud to say I'm the CEO of the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation. So I jumped at coming to this event with my volunteer manager, and I think it's critical that every CEO should be in this room. Um, Toowoomba is obviously a big region, and I encourage anybody who would want to come and visit the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation. I've learned more by sitting with other organisations and actually borrowing policies, stealing information, running similar events in another region. Um, and I encourage everybody to actually come to another group to actually learn what they're doing with their volunteers or their organisations as a whole. I just think it's absolutely mind blowing. You learn more than you do at the FIAs and all that sort of stuff. Hope no one's an advocate of that. Anyway, um, too late, I said it out loud. Um, and also my question is, it's a really hard one. But the elder gener older generation volunteered, but they didn't start when they were 60. They started when they were 40. They started when they were 30. They started when they were 20. Like, how do we get this younger generation, especially in regional Australia, we look after an area twice the size of Tasmania, 29 facilities, auxiliaries are dying. Sorry, that's probably a bad word. Um, but, you know, like, what? how do we get this younger generation to actually start volunteering? Okay, I'll just say one thing. Vol younger vol people do volunteer. As I've always said, why would I want to volunteer for an organisation that my grandmother does or my father or my mother? I mean, when you think about it, I mean, when you look at my family, my, my grandmother didn't join the CWA. She did Red Cross. My mother didn't do either of CWA or the Red Cross. She went into environmental activism and the National Trust. OK, so my first point is younger people do volunteer. They're just doing different things. That's the first thing, I think. And I think the younger generation is much more altruistic and, and, and um, committed to um, themselves than the baby boomers were at their age. I mean, come on, guys, we were just, we, we were out there, you know, having a good time. 
Sorry. So my I, my point is, you have to go out there and find find well, ask them what they how they want to do it because they want to do it differently. They won't want to do it. We don't wear the same clothes as our grandparents. Why do we want to volunteer in the same organisations or in the same way? Of course, there are exceptions to that, but I really think they are there. You just have, we have to think very differently, very creatively about how to engage them. But a growing area like Toowoomba, they're there. And I'm sure if you actually went to the schools and could get past all the occupational health and safety, and I must say, I've been thinking about insurance with you a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just wondered about that. Yeah. So, so that that would be my answer to that. <laughs> I know it's a problem, but I think it's it's solvable. We just have to think a little bit outside the box. That I really think that. Hmm? Yeah. Really quick shout out here. I'm from Southern Volunteering. Uh, I was one of the presenters of the youth volunteering segment, and I also had a few things to say in the student volunteering segment. Southern Volunteering as a VRC is piloting a, an innovative youth program. My name is Blaze Pilgrim. Come find me. Come talk to me. There are resources we have developed. We have done research that is applicable nationwide. So come have a chat. We've got some really interesting insights in that topic. Alrighty, thank you. And that's a lovely way to end.